everybody, it's Elizabeth here. Oh, I've got a bit of glare on my glasses today. And I'm here with another Facebook Live video session. And today I'm delighted that I'll be joining her in uh, in just a second. Um, Carly Nagard, one of our project management um, cafe Facebook group participants, is coming along to uh, talk to us today. So let me see if I can join her in. Should I have to swipe? Swipe. I think Facebook's just taking a little while to acknowledge the fact that there are people who are joining. So I will just uh, wait to see that notification because I can see that I think she's here. And um, we are going to be talking about lessons learned and also project implementation because those are the two things that I know that Colleen's got a ton of experience in because the group is full of fantastic people who have lots of experience in all of um, lots of different areas of project management. Hi Shannon, nice to see you. Um, and I can see that there's people here, I just can't do it. And we did a test last night, so this is absolutely possible to do. So I'm just going to hang on and make sure that I can get Facebook to tell me. And hi Simon, nice to see you. And uh, Colleen, if you're on, just it might be easier if you um, add a comment and then I'll be able to see that you can join. <laughs> So, um, right, what we are going to, um, for those of you who haven't come to a Facebook Live Q&A before, what we do is, if there's questions in the group that we haven't answered during the week, then I will try and pick some of those out and um, we can talk about that. And also we sometimes do like special guest interviews. And today we are doing a special guest interview. And I can see that Carlene is here now and I'm going to click invite to the broadcast. So pop up invite. Um, invite now showing. So hopefully we will get Carleen to join us in just a second. Oh, and there you are. Hello. Wow. It looks like you're on the beach. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm actually in an office at the moment, but it's just a nice, particularly nice part of the office. Yeah, we've got um, quite good weather here as well, which makes a change because we've had pretty bad, pretty bad weather. For the south of England, anyway, obviously not as bad as some other places in the world. So, well, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, I know that we had a chat the other day, and we've got lots of cool stuff to talk about. So, I think perhaps it would be a good start to um, to introduce yourself to everybody. So, tell us a bit about you and your background. Sure. Thank you for having me here. Um, so, I've worked in the rail industry for four and a half years. I worked in safety reporting, and then I moved to change project management. And then I worked as a risk and value analyst on the major products division within Network Rail. And um, during my time there, I really enjoyed working with major projects and helping them to get set up for success. So starting them correctly from the beginning. A lot of the time mm -hmm. I noticed that um, you, there's this desire within the project management community to get things done. So people have their yeah. ideas of what they'd like to do and they'll look to progress with it, but they won't necessarily step back and say what is it we're really trying to achieve and what is the best way to achieve that so one of the things that you do within value management is come up with a framework which will help you to say these are the outcomes that we need from this project and then that can use you can use that to guide you throughout the project management process to help you figure out what is the best option to deliver and get you that outcome that you need so, so that's uh, all about since starting it right isn't it yes yes absolutely and uh, since then, I've moved to TfL, working as a risk manager, and currently I'm on secondment to Parliament, but actually not working within a project management role there. And I will have to say that the views expressed in this video are my own <laughs> and not <laughs> representative of my workplace. No, fair enough. I'm, I, I'm sure that some of the stuff you work on, you can't talk about anyway. <laughs> so we won't talk about that. Um, so you talked a lot there about working major projects and setting up a project right and the value management side of things. So not everybody works in, on big projects, but I'm sure there's some commonalities. So what would you say would be the things that project managers should think about doing at project initiation? So at the beginning, you really need to understand the core outcomes that you need delivered from this project. So have that clearly agreed with the project management team. You need your sponsors on board with that and any senior stakeholders within your organisation that are a party to this need to be on board because really a lot of the time 
they'll be the people that will later on down the line be introducing changes and scope changes. So if you get them involved right from the beginning, then you have the best chance of having a project that um, they, a project scope that is bought into by the people that need to buy into it. So right at the beginning, you need to, have to clearly understand and define what the outcomes are that, that you need. And in order to do that, you have a great tool in value management called functional analysis. So that's just about understanding your core objectives and clearly outlying them. So it provides you with a framework and you can use that in so many different ways. So you start off with your high level objectives and you very simply uh, state what it is that you, you're looking to achieve and then you come up with secondary objectives and really it's functionality that you need um, and then uh, build up a diagram which reflects the outcomes that you need. So the idea is that you do that, from, sorry. <laughs> Right. If, would that diagram that look like a mind map? Uh, somewhat. You have, you have the... Oh, I wish I'd brought something that I could show you. Um, so you have the... Oh, my arms are getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me try and change the angle. Okay. So you, have the, you write the objectives on... A high-level objective on the left side of the page, and then you've got your secondary objectives coming out of that. So basically, you've got a small point at the left where you have maybe one, one high-level objective for the whole program. And then mm -hmm. to the right, you've got branches coming out of that. And you'll have that at each stage. So you have secondary objectives and tertiary objectives and potentially some going, following on from that. But the idea there is that you keep it really high level. So you're not um, dictating how you do it. You're just dictating what it is that you want done. And then later on down the process, you can say, this is, these are all the different ways that we can achieve it based on what it is that we need in terms of functionality. Okay, so get really clear about the objectives. And Simon's asked a question actually underneath our video. How do you help people express their appetite and tolerance to risk? So does, I'm guessing that from what you just described, risk doesn't really come into it because at the moment you're just describing what you want to do, not how you're going to do it. Well, but is there something that you can do at the beginning of a project to help people put risk front, front of mind? Yes, I mean, one of the things that I like to do is have a uh, understand the high level risk. So if you've got, particularly with major projects, because of the significance and the scale, they tend to introduce risk to the organisation. So you can look at the strategic objectives of the organisation and say, how is it that this project could impact achievement of those objectives? And you really need to make sure that you're looking at opportunities as well as threats, because People tend to think uh, threats all automatically when you say risk, but opportunities are important yeah. to consider as well. Yeah, we talk a lot. Well, from a risk, if I'm writing about risk management, I will always write, oh, don't forget opportunities, but I don't think sure. people really do that in real life. So it's interesting, <laughs> certainly not in my world anyway, maybe in IT software projects it's a bit different, but you can, I can certainly see the value of doing it for a big major project because things could go so right and that would have a massive implication. Sam just took on the I have to really clear because I've taken my glasses off for the last bit. <laughs> what do you want in pursuit of opportunity which is the upside outcome versus the baseline cost? Yes, so you'll you'll put extra effort into doing things that are going to give you the biggest return. Um, yes, that um, that's one of the benefits of value management because people often have that negative slant when you think about risk. It, it uses different tools from, that you, mm -hmm. from what you typically use within risk. And so it allows you, allows you to think in a slightly different way and be a bit more creative about the opportunities that are available. It's one of the reasons why I really like value management. I think the two, value and risk, go together. They're, they're really intertwined. But it seems like the so how value would I find management out? side isn't as recognised. How would I find out more about value management? I mean, have you so got you've got books the, that you recommend? You've got the Institute of Value Management. Uh, you've got mm -hmm. Lawrence Mars, who, who's produced a really great guide. He's one of the, um, is like recognised as a, a founding father of, of value management. I can send you the no, details of, of some books that I'd recommend on that in particular. But the Institute of Value Management is, is very good. And they've got a great training framework as well. And also their website has quite a bit of resources. You can join the LinkedIn group too. Mm -hmm. And also okay. people so can get in touch with me if they're, they're curious as well, because I'd be happy to share my experience. Thank you very much. Um, 
So what are you currently working on? Because I know that while you're interested in value management, you, you'd be telling me about a very interesting project about the end projects yesterday. Yes. Um, so I am quite interested in lessons learned exercises, and that's, that's really part of value management. But what, what you typically see is obviously with a lesson learned exercise, you look at what's gone well and what's gone poorly in a project and see what is it that we can learn from both of those things to improve in the future. Now, typically, mm -hmm. lessons learned sessions take place at the very end of a project. And I think that's quite a waste because there's so much that can be learned. And rather than saying, oh, well, we, we messed up there, you could use that to shape the rest of the project and improve it. So that's one of the key things for me. Don't just do it at the very end. You need to do it uh, at different stage gates, for example. And you can say, OK, you may, you may be working with a, a contractor throughout the project. If you've had issues at the beginning, don't just keep those going to the end and then say at the end of the lesson, the final lessons learned, oh, well, that, that hasn't gone well. We messed up there. What you can do instead is say, this hasn't gone well. Yeah, <laughs> you could say, well, with lessons learned, you really need to understand why, um, what's happened, why it's happened, what the drivers are, so that you can get to the root solution, which will allow you to figure out a way to improve in the future. And you can use that on the same project. And also, as part, when you're starting up a project, you should be looking at the lessons learned from previous projects. You should be looking at the risk registers. There's no need to reinvent the wheel every single time. Use the knowledge mm -hmm. that you have available within the organization. Um, another comment. Thank you, Jonathan, for that book recommendation. I'll take a look at that. Uh, institutionalized LFE at the start. What's LFE? Lessons something? Simon, add another comment that explains that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I think, I mean, agile, um, uh, agile projects tend to have agile retrospectives at the end of a sprint. So, you know, the, the culture is there in other methodologies. Mm. And I'm a big fan of doing lessons learned as you go, you can get it into the fabric of projects. You're then capturing things to make things better for this actual project and not wait until the end yeah. when you're just going to do a, a big thing. Put the notes in the drawer, never look at it again. That's not helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. That, that's one of the key things, really. You need to uh, also make sure when you're doing lessons learned reports, you tend to find the, ex the actual workshop itself is really beneficial people talk about things uh, you come up with ideas and improvements and then it gets put in a report and then it's eternally archived and then nothing happens with all of that learning and it's lost when people leave the organization you need to make sure that the lessons that you're capturing during the workshop are embedded into the organization so the actions and lessons need to drive change within the organization so you may come up with specific actions so it may be a, a specific process element or uh, a detail needs to change within your organization so that you're better able to uh, succeed in the future and yeah. also um, you need to make sure that those lessons can be found so if you've got a SharePoint for instance you can put metadata onto those lessons uh, you, you did ask me about what I'm working on at the moment and um, I'm doing a report for the APM project magazine looking at lessons learned and how social media is used within lessons learned. So okay. I felt like that there are a number of questions that I was asked to contribute to that report. And I felt like there were some things that I was comfortable asking, answering myself. But some of them were talking about how widely social media is used to distribute lessons learned. And for me, um, I didn't feel confident, confident answering that for myself because I could talk for the organizations that I've worked with. But obviously, that doesn't re represent the whole spectrum of project management experience. So I sent out a survey, which I will be happy to share with um, people who are watching yes, this please. live the link in the comments afterwards. After and I, yes, yes, I will do. I really appreciate it if you wouldn't mind uh, completing the survey. It's got about six questions. It's really quick. But it just asks a few questions about how lessons learned is used in your organization. Uh, sorry, how social media is used within your organization to uh, distribute lessons learned. Now, there are a few challenges that I've been finding with that and that organizations may be reticent to share and it could be for reputational reasons if something's gone wrong people don't really want to put that in the public domain it could be for commercial reasons so you don't want your competitors to learn from what you're doing and improve as as you're improving um, and there and then also you've got internal barriers so people might, are wary about speaking as themselves and saying something on behalf of the organization and concerned that they may not be able to share adequately 
Mm-hmm. Um, Jonathan, or they may get in trouble for what they share. Uh, yeah, this this might be a question that you've come across. With oh, Jonathan. Lessons learned. Jonathan's asked, how, I don't know if you can see <laughs> Hello. these comments. At some point. How do you capture I lessons can, I can see that you can't write down? <laughs> how do you capture lessons that you can't write down? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, Is that because some, some lessons, I imagine, would be too politically sensitive to document in your lessons learned because you can't put that particular person ruin my project. Or you'd have to find no. a very creative way of doing it, which would dilute what you're talking about to the point that it's probably not useful anymore. But I can see that, you know, especially in some of the top secret or, you know, commercially sensitive projects that, that you might have worked on, or major projects, some of the things are so nebulous or so private that you can't document them. That yes, and them. that um, freedom of information can also make that a particular challenge. Um, within certain organizations i think if you can't write it down then you have to either try and make it generic or um you have to rely on on word of mouth and and it needs to be embedded um organizationally so you you need to communicate with people i mean having it documented is is the easiest way but if you can't write it then you know you have to you have to speak about it with the relevant people and if it's a, a personnel issue then that may be something that needs to be raised with HR or maybe there are lessons to be learned about recruitment or how behavioral issues are challenged mm-hmm. but that that was also one of the things that um, have, has been interesting from the survey results so people writing is, is one way to capture lessons learned but you can also do it via uh, short videos which I think is a, a really good tip you can have a project manager that just do a, a quick recording and say and this also will prevent it from being too onerous to do just a quick recording to yeah. say in this type of situation you might want to do this instead of this because we found that this was an issue and this is what it led to so try doing this instead and then you can just upload that onto uh, your uh, knowledge management system for instance and then so and that's that really that? beneficial so yes, i'm a big fan of you i think um when you're talking about sharing on social media, you're talking about sharing in the public domain, being very transparent, aren't you? Are you? Well, yes. that's... Would you say um, something like Slack is uh, social media, or is that just an internal comms channel? That's a good question. Now, one of the things that I've found, I, I've spoken with Jonathan, and that was really helpful. Um, he's got the major projects knowledge hub, which he's, he's been mm-hmm. working on, major project management knowledge hub which he's been working on and that has a number of different tiers so some communities are open and some communities are closed now the benefit of that is that when it's a closed community um it's clearly known who's writing what and who has access to see what so people can be a bit more open and share things that they wouldn't share in the public domain and then there are some communities which are open access and anybody can gain it uh, can get in to uh, see what's on there and also to contribute so that's a really beneficial approach because um then you know there's not that filtering and screening so i think for social media some of it can be open some of it can be closed i would say yammer counts as social media because um you've got that interactive element you've got people talking freely and it's on a online so I, I would include yammer as social media and that can also be a good tool in the same way that i've mentioned you can put lessons up there you can um use metadata so you can search for videos or uh, text descriptions of lessons learned in in yammer as well there are a number of organizations using yammer as a tool okay great well thank you very much so i <laughs> think we all want to do your survey well um we if we do it do we get to see the results the results will be in the apm magazine won't they project magazine um i'm not necessarily going to do the whole produce publish the whole res- results there if you're interested in seeing all of the results then message me and i'll be able to share certainly the uh, so some of the questions are binary um, or multiple choice questions and I'll certainly be happy to share them with people directly if they are, they are interested. They can get in touch with me. Um, message, my name is Carleen Agard. Uh, you'll see my, my spelling there. So just okay. find me on LinkedIn, get in touch and I'll be happy to share those results with you. For the, uh, some of the questions have text answers. Now, I haven't asked people's permission to share those um, 
unedited. So I probably would be hesitant to do that without getting that permission specifically. Um, but I will be using the overarching themes and knowledge that I've got from that to inform what I put in the article. Brilliant. Okay, well, I look forward to reading it. And thank you so much for giving up some time this afternoon to, to come onto Facebook and to share your experience of all the cool stuff you've done about project initiation and also <laughs> your experience with lessons learned. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's, it's been good speaking to you. No, it's, um, it's great to share the screen with somebody. So, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so it only remains for me to say thanks very much for everybody who uh, joined us live. And if you're watching the replay, I hope that you enjoy that too. And um, I will see you next week in the next Facebook Live Q&A video. And if anybody out there would like to do what Carleen has, has stepped up to do today and share your area of expertise, then please do get in touch because um, this is our group. So we might as well all draw on the experience of the people. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks, bye. Bye.